Welcome to TYT's The Conversation. I am Maitha Alhassan. Today, I have some powerful and moving guests, and we're just going to get right on to it. I wanted to start today with a conversation around what's happening in Lebanon and how folks can be involved and learn a little bit more about the crisis. So before we begin, I'm going to introduce our very special guest, Lebanese Canadian slow fashion climate justice activist who's a co-founder of Slow Factory. We can talk a little bit about that more later. We have to have you on for something to do with climate justice at some other point because we do that on TYT. We have big conversations around that. But today you're here because we are going to talk about Lebanon. This is your home, this is your country. You wrote a powerful article on Vogue just a day after the explosion. I don't know how you were able to do that. Um, the explosion that happened in Beirut uh, with 2,700 tons of aluminum nitrate that devastated the city. But it's not just only about the explosion. There's a certain context that the explosion happened within that set off decades of mismanagement, of corruption, of so much crisis. So before we get into that, I want to share that context. And I want to throw to your article from Vogue a couple of quotes that I think are really helpful for people to be able to understand what's happening. So I'm just going to read from them. Before the disaster, Lebanese people were already struggling to make ends meet during the COVID-19 pandemic. Against the backdrop of long-standing political unrest, an unprecedented economic crisis and famine, with a corrupt political elite, high rates of unemployment, and inadequate access to vital resources, including electricity, water, and waste management, the price of food, fuel, and basic necessities have skyrocketed. According to Carnegie Middle East Center, one in three Lebanese people have reportedly lost their jobs. The World Bank has estimated that almost 22% of Lebanese live below the extreme poverty line, while thousands have been going hungry. Inflation reached almost 90% in June 2020, while the price of basic goods increased by around 55% in May. So this is what's happening. Catch viewers up to speed with the historical, political, economic, and social antecedents that have coalesced to produce this catastrophe, this explosion at the port that just happened. Absolutely. First, thank you so much, Mesa, for having me. Uh, it's it's an honor to be here to support Lebanon and to be uh, the voice of uh, of what's going on right now. Uh, as you said, Lebanon was fighting political unrest, a famine, a pandemic, an unprecedented economic crisis, and now a deadly explosion. In October of 2019, a revolution started. What we refer to as Thaura, triggered by a corrupt political system, dysfunctional national institutions constant electoral fraud, absence of basic services like electricity, clean drinking water. And as you said in my article, waste management on top of high unemployment rate. Since October, the currency has plummeted as we can say, as we can read, uh, sorry, in my article, sending the country into a total economic collapse. But this was also part of the uh, international uh, uh, on non-support basically, on August 4th of 2020, a bomb exploded at the port, destroying Beirut's most active and creative neighborhoods. Who was who was to blame? And how would the public react after this uh, this explosion when the Lebanon was already uh, supporting and, and handling so much trauma, so many crises? Every single hand drew the public back to the corrupt government in a criminal act of negligence. And we can go into into that uh, when you're ready. Yeah, I do want to pull back a little bit and connect people to your relationship with Lebanon. You start out this article talking about the message that you received from your sister back home. So I just wanted you to speak about that. Definitely. So I am Lebanese. I live in New York. Uh, I have my entire family living in Lebanon, like most of us uh, in the expat community. Uh, we are, you know, one of the biggest diaspora in the world because we live in a country that's almost inhabitable from climate crises to uh, wildfires to the economic crisis. Uh, 
our family members, our communities, they rely on us for so many things. Um, and our direct family rely, rely on us for, uh, for safety, for economic safety and all sorts of things. So when you get those texts from your families, your heart stops and you never know what's going on. And sometimes you call them and they don't answer and you constantly live in this, uh, this, this fear that something may, might have happened. But whatever can happen, we never expected such a thing to happen in August. Your family home was destroyed along with so many other homes. About 5,000 plus people have been injured. I don't know what the latest count is, over 100 have passed away and people remain missing. I, what I wanna know more about, which in your article was fascinating to me, actually in our conversation, which was what is um, the banking crisis? That happened. What is the reason for this economic collapse that Lebanon is experiencing that inspired a Thawra revolution back in October? So again, I am not a political analyst, but what I can tell you is what the public has been saying, what the people on the streets have been saying. The, there is a big economic crisis due to the fact that there is uh, there are sanctions on Lebanon at the moment, and these sanctions are controlled by the uh, uh, World Bank. Not only that, we also have a corrupt political elite, uh, warlords, if you may, that have taken money from the public and that continue to. Uh, you know, use the money from the, 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 the banks, from the general public to their own advantage. Um, you know, our government is sectarian, filled with corruption and nepotism. And Lebanon, uh, uh, regarding the bank secrecy of Lebanon, this means that no one is obligated to show their bank transactions. This has it's enabled- crazy. Which is crazy, exactly as you say. This has enabled so much money laundering and fraud and stealing people's savings, money in US dollars to pay their own corrupt debt. And given that Lebanon imports almost 85% of what we consume, all of our dollars are spent abroad, leaving the country with close to no dollars and plummeting our currency, which was previously pegged to the US dollar. You said this in your article as well, which is that Lebanon's not able to sustain itself and that port itself was where people received imported food goods and they're currently on the edge of a famine, not just an economic collapse. So what is happening now? How are people able to survive? So first, everyone whose home and businesses was within kilometers of this blast. Uh, we have friends and relatives who, uh, you know, uh, had stitches from glass flying in their faces, broken bones and worse, you know. Uh, Beirut, what was hit of Beirut is what has, is basically the most vibrant communities, businesses, um, you know, uh, artist districts, um, you know, creative districts, historical districts, um, you know, things that are uh, archaeological, historical. It's, uh, I have only the French word in mind, but it's the patrimoine. It's basically what belongs to our culture. Beirut is an ancient city. It has, you know, thousands of years of history. And, uh, and as you said, we also have thousands of years of colonialism behind us. Uh, from every single nation and the port of Beirut is the port where we uh, rely on for over 60% of our imports of goods to live on at the moment, as well as the historical significance of the port of Beirut and our connection to Europe and to Asia and to the rest of the world. And beyond the immediate damage, we have to think of the economic impact. This blast hit some of the most thriving businesses and entertainment areas of Beirut and now those businesses will be shut. So we have to think about the people who own and work in these businesses. How will they now make ends meet? For some of them, they've lost both their homes and their businesses. And we have to especially think of the most vulnerable populations in Lebanon. These are refugees and migrant workers. Somewhere between a quarter and third of Lebanon's population are refugees. And the, there are hundreds of thousands of migrant workers. These are often in the most low paying and dangerous jobs. And so many are already suffering as the first to feel the effects of the 
the economic crisis that ha was already growing in the past six months before this explosion even happened. Yeah. And I really need to highlight, especially the situation of foreign domestic workers. They exist in Lebanon and they also exist in the Middle East. And it's because of an exploitative system called the kafala system, which organizations such as Egna Legna and This Is Lebanon are now working to abolish. Thank you for that. And of course, there are so many organizations working on the ground, Agna Legna, uh, Legna that you mentioned. Um, and also there are other vulnerable communities like refugee communities. Um, Lebanon has one of the highest per capita rates of refugees in the world. What are some other ways that people can help out with relief as we as we close this conversation? Of course, in close to 50 years of war, you know, we've never seen anything like this. Uh, close, like as you said, close to 300,000 people were homeless in 10 seconds. The Sursa Museum, which is our heritage neighborhoods, uh, were, you know, they, 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 they survived the war and in 10 seconds completely disappeared. If you want to support Lebanese people, I would urge you to support Lebanese run and Lebanese led organization, whether they are international or on the ground, organizations such as Impact Lebanon, Seal for Lebanon, or Slow Factory Foundation, which is our foundation that is launching a fund called the Super Fund for Beirut, providing grants to individuals who are rebuilding their businesses and working at the intersection of human rights and environmental justice. Please donate, please learn more. Thank you, Celine, so much for being a part of this conversation. We're gonna have to have you on again. Um, and my heart goes out to you and your family and your community. Thank you, thank you, Mesa. On the go, don't worry, we got you covered. You can still listen to TYT at our new podcast network. Find us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or at tyt.com slash podcast.